My name is Melinda Carson. For some reason, my friends just call me Linda. My dad calls me Keith, and he... Wait a second. I need to do something. Shut up, Mom. If you don't stop this damn crying right now, I'll have the doorman escort you out of here. This is a happy occasion. Haven't you noticed that everyone here is smiling? I hissed at the woman sitting just inches from where I was standing. But this shouldn't happen. She whines through tears. She looks at me for sympathy and finds none. Mom, everyone in town is here and having a great time. You, more than anyone else in town, are responsible for this and for the party that comes next. So deal with it and try to enjoy it. I hiss again. Luckily for me, my voice doesn't carry far. I just smile and wave to the two or three people who noticed our conversation. Everyone else's eyes are focused on the back of the church. Anyway, as I was about to say, my dad is the only person who can get away with calling me Keith. Damn, I lost my train of thought. I have no idea what I was going to tell you. Okay, I think the story is over. No, you won't get off that easy, but since I don't remember where I was, I should probably start from the beginning. About a year ago, I walked into my house after school. I had to choose an outfit to wear to the school's harvest dancy. The harvest festival was a big deal because it was the only outdoor dinner and dance we had. We live in California and our weather is moderate. We don't see the wild storms that happen along the coast in the fall, and we don't see the landslides that happen near the mountains. We are lucky that in October and November the temperatures are still mild enough to enjoy dancing outside. The evening air is a little chilly, but a light jacket or cape is sufficient. I needed the right outfit. Even though I'm not a cheerleader, I am quite popular, so I need to make a good impression. I don't have to worry about getting a date or impressing anyone because I've had the same guy since sophomore year. Considering he's a preacher's kid, he's very moral. We focus more on entertainment than sex. My goal, which my mother had drilled into me since I was old enough to understand, was for me to walk down the aisle a virgin, but for my husband to wake up tired the day after the wedding. I intended to do something more. I was going to make Dean wake up scared. Part of the reason for my popularity is my brain. I participated in the National Honor Society every year in high school and, with the exception of my freshman year, I maintained a 4.0 GPA. In my first year, I got a C in physical education. I've never been very athletic. That year, as usual, my dad came to my aid. In the summer, he made me run with him every morning. When I went back to school, all the stupid things I had to do to get an A became very easy. After our run, my dad and I worked on the machines in his home gym. Unbeknownst to me, my body changed over that summer. I became much stronger, but also lost weight in some key areas. I think it was the bench presses, but my breasts got bigger over the summer. Not only did my skinny legs and butt get bigger, but they also took on a better shape. And the changes weren't just cosmetic. I was much stronger and much more coordinated. The first day at the gym was the day I dreaded. It was the day they made assessments. The assessments were designed to see where you rank on the national fitness scale. It was based on how many push-ups, squats, and pull-ups you could do. There was also a rope climb and finally a mile run. It usually took us the first week of school to get everyone tested. I did terribly my freshman year. And when the school was assessed again last week, I had to demonstrate a, a significant improvement in my fitness, and I didn't. That's why they gave me a C. My father looked at my report card and didn't say a word. He just hugged me and told me he was proud of me. I thought he would be a little upset, but he clearly wasn't. When we started running together, he simply suggested it to us as a fun way to spend more time together. And being a daddy's girl, I was all for it. He was very thin. We slowly increased the distance and duration of the races. We talked as we ran, laughed and joked. I could tell my father anything. When he started talking after a run one day about us going on vacation, I followed him to the gym and it seemed natural to start doing curls with him. In fact, it took me a while to realize that he had planned this. There was already a dumbbell with very light weights next to his heavier bell. Before I knew it, I had an entire training session with him. 
and we would go out or just have breakfast together before starting the day. He didn't attach much importance to it. It's not that I was ever overweight, I was just out of shape, and he gently pushed me to become more toned. The first thing I noticed when I returned to school after that summer was that there were a lot of people, both men and women, looking at me in my sports uniform. What the hell happened to you this summer? asked Becky Thatcher. Becky has been my best friend since birth and lives around the corner from me. Since both my parents, like her, worked, we met in kindergarten. Did you take supermodel classes or something? She asked. Do you have implants? No, I smiled. Damn it, what did you do? She asked. I was just spending time with Dad, I said. But I did highlighting and highlighting my hair. Maybe that's the point. Last year I was able to do eight women's push-ups and 20 squats. After that, I almost felt sick. I continued to talk to Becky during my approach. I did 25 push-ups and noticed everyone was looking at me as I moved on to the next exercise to do squats. The physical education teacher ran up to me and asked who I was. Even Becky was looking at me. Linda, you did 25 push-ups, she said, perplexed. I should have been quiet while I was making them, I said. Perhaps I could do more. I didn't pay much attention. Linda, you did push-ups the man's way, she said. Apart from the athletes and some fans... No one even came close to your result. Before the time was up, the teacher told me to stop doing squats. You only had to do 50 to reach the maximum on the scale, he said. Last year, I couldn't do a single pull-up. I had to do what they called a hang. In a hanging, you pull yourself up and hang there, keeping your chin over the bar for as long as you can. They had to lift me into place because I couldn't pull myself up. I was only able to hang for about two seconds. This year, I went right after Big Mill. Milburn Drysdale, Big Mill, was the center forward of our football team. Big Mill weighed over 200 pounds in high school. All that weight made it difficult for him to do pull-ups, but he was strong as a bull and did 11 pull-ups. I jumped on the bar and did 12. When my feet touched the floor, a muffled sigh was heard in the gym. My dad made me do several sets of pull-ups with a weight belt around my waist. Our reward system gave me a donut or treat every time I beat my previous score. The second and third approaches were the most difficult. I was used to doing eight pull-ups with 25 pounds strapped around my waist. Doing just one set of 12 without additional weight was hardly a challenge. It was the end of the first day of physical education class. Everyone was already talking about me. Boys who had never paid me any attention before were now hovering around us. Becky liked the attention. We were still sitting at the table with the same people we always were with. I already knew what I wanted to do with my life, so being around smart people was a good idea. I like to think that I never changed throughout high school. But in my second year, the way other people saw me changed. This happened last year, in my last year of study. Like I said, I was trying to find the perfect outfit and got home early. My English teacher was sick and there was no substitute. Since English was my last lesson, we were released early. As I walked through the house, I heard the sounds of moaning coming from my parents' bedroom. I did not think about that. I was 18 years old. I knew what sex was, although I had never had it. I knew it would be good for my parents, and I didn't blame them for it. I knocked on their door and told them that when they finished, I needed help with something. My mom always gave me fashion advice. My dad always gave me a man's opinion about how I looked. Dad, where's Mustang? I asked. My father never went anywhere without this car, and he never put it on display in the store without complaining to me about how much he would miss it. Suddenly, my memory went haywire. I remembered hearing my mother's moaning voice, but not my father's. I pushed the door open and was overcome with rage. I saw my mother hurriedly trying to get dressed and the principal of my high school pulling up his pants. You're a damn traitor, I screamed at my mother. And you, Mr. Eddington, my father will kick your ass. When all this is cleared up, you will be looking for a new job. I slammed the door and ran out of the house. I hadn't even walked a block when my phone started ringing. I looked at the display and saw that it was my mother. I pressed the answer button and immediately hung up. I went to Becky's house. I hung out with Becky that day and stayed with her until I was sure my dad was home. As I walked up the driveway, I saw his Mustang. Large chrome exhaust pipes, chrome wheels and racing stripes 
made the car look much more sinister than it actually was. I think we all see things differently. My dad looked at the car and saw beauty. I looked at it and it just looked angry, with blades and scoops and wings, and the sound it made. That car was damn loud. But for my father, the sound of these pipes was like music. I used my key and entered the door. My mother immediately became nervous as soon as I walked through the door. Hey, Keith, my father said, smiling. He came over and hugged me like he always did. My father squeezes me so tightly that I can feel the love oozing out of him. Are you okay, kitten? He asked. It's been a hard day, Dad, I began. You know how you go through life thinking you can count on certain people and they just turn out to be full of it? Mom turned pale at my words. Melinda, may I... She began. I turned my head sharply and looked at her intently. My father didn't notice the exchange. Dad, we need to talk about something, I said. Of course, Keith, he said. Do you want to wait until after dinner, or should we do it now? It's okay after dinner, Daddy, I said. My father always looked at things from the outside. No matter what the problem was, he made me feel safe. Other people also treated him the same way. My father was an automobile engineer. He solved problems for a living. He just knew how to look at things from a different angle. Great, he said. I want to install my own tuner on my car. I think I'll have to tone down the power and throttle response a bit. My gas mileage has never been great, but now it really sucks. You go play with your car, dear, Mom said. Melinda and I will prepare dinner. She grabbed my hand and pulled me into the kitchen after she kissed my dad. Just seeing her touch his lips made me feel sick after everything I'd seen. Melinda, dear, she began. I know you're supposed to be my mother, but get your damn hands off me right now, I hissed. Don't ever touch me again. Melinda, you have to let me explain this, she said. Explain what? I snorted. You've been telling me nothing but nonsense all your life. You and Dad have always been like switches. Dad always told me that I can do anything I want. If I want to be on the student council, he said, go for it. You said that a lot of people are running, but only six are chosen, so the chances are slim. You said I shouldn't run for prom queen because she always gets picked from the cheerleaders. My dad gave me a necklace that said I was his prom queen before the election started. When I won, he asked me if I had ever doubted. You were shocked. You never believed in me, Mom. You constantly tell me what not to do. You filled my head with everything I can't do or shouldn't do. Melinda, your skirt is too short. Melinda, good girls don't do that. Melinda, people will think you're a slut if you wear this. When I decided to take pre-law in college because I decided to become a prosecutor and help bring criminals who hurt other people to justice, what did you tell me? You said, Melinda, this is not what a girl should do. It seems all you ever wanted was to pour cold water on my dreams, Mom. Watch your language, young lady, she said. I'm still yours. What's yours? I asked. Are you still my shining example of what a woman should be? I don't think you are, unless every woman has to be a cheater. Dad deserves someone who loves him and is loyal to him. Oh, wait. Isn't this the same nonsense you told me once I started thinking about boys? If you can't walk that path, maybe you shouldn't even talk about it. But Melinda, I love your father. It was just an oversight. I made one mistake. I'm a human, too. Please give me one more chance. This won't happen again, she wailed. Mom, mistakes happen suddenly or when you're drunk. This was intentional and has likely happened before. It's no accident that you bring a man home and sleep with him in my father's bed. You also work with him every day. He is also married and has small children at home. You destroyed two families because you made one mistake. Melinda, I'm so sorry, she said. Please don't do this. This will hurt your father and tear our family apart needlessly. You just said it. Why destroy two families to punish me? Do you want your father to get hurt? Pick up that damn phone, call that asshole, and tell him you're quitting right now. Find another job somewhere else if you have to, but if you go back to school for any reason, I'll tell Dad. Immediately. Give me your cell phone. If this asshole calls you, I'll answer. 
And mom, I'll be checking phone records around the house as soon as the bills come in from now on. If you call even once, you know what will happen. And from now on, don't talk to me, period. As far as I understand, you died today. I am an orphan. I want you to convince my dad to sleep in the guest room tonight and don't have sex with him. Tomorrow I want you to buy a new bed and burn it. Tell him it's hool rod or bed bugs or something like that. I don't care what it is, but you better make it happen. But Melinda, your father will notice if we don't act the same as always. And it's your senior year. A lot of things will happen to you soon. There will be times when you need a woman's opinion or advice. I know you're a daddy's girl. Always have been. But you need your mom, too, she said. I will find someone I can trust and look up to to fill this role. I hissed. Remember what I said. I turned and left the kitchen. I went and took her purse and handed it to her. Melinda, can I call him on the phone? She asked. No, because I have your phone. Give it back, I said. She gave me her sleek iPhone. I have to get you to call him at home, I said. So his wife will probably answer the phone and you will have to ask her if you can talk to him. You will have to listen to the sounds of his children playing in the background. Maybe it will make you realize how terrible you are. Melinda, do you have to use that kind of language? She asked in a whiny tone. Yes, Teresa, I said. You once told me that being a lady is not just knowing how to curtsy and use the right fork. Being a lady means doing, acting, and speaking in the right manner appropriate to the situation. Do you remember this? She nodded her head. Well, when I'm with a person who has no morals, no class, and has the nerve to cheat on someone who loves her very much, that's the language that suits the situation. Besides, you and I will not talk. From now on, a lot will happen. And once I leave for college next fall, the only time we'll have to see each other is when I'm home visiting my dad. I have one more request for you, Mom, I said. She looked at me pleadingly. This is for the future. From now on, whenever a big event happens in my life, I want you to be sick, injured, or simply unavailable. This means I don't want you to attend my graduation. I don't want you at my college graduation either. I don't want you at my wedding. And if I ever have children, I expect you won't be there. All clear? I asked. She nodded. Call him. She picked up her home phone and dialed Eddington's number. I'll have to quit my job, she said. At the moment you need another secretary. I won't be back at all. Have someone pack my personal items and send them to me. That someone will not be you. Mail my latest check or deposit it directly. Dawn. Don't call me again, or Melinda will tell my husband and your family. Goodbye. Well done, Teresa, I said. It was painful. What hurts? She asked. Tell your lover that you can't see each other anymore? I asked. Does this tug at the heartstrings? Do you feel that emptiness in your stomach? No, Melinda, she said sadly. I don't like Russell. I love only your father. Russell was just... Shut up, I snorted. If you loved my dad, you wouldn't... Melinda, you are very young now, she said. One day you will understand that. I hope I never understand anything the way you see it, I said sharply. I will never understand how a woman who is married to a man who loves her completely can cheat on him with someone like Mr. Eddington. Do you even know half the rumors about him? I mean, you're obviously stupid, but are you that stupid? Mom, you are far from the first woman or even the first woman in our school with whom he started an affair. You're just the last one. I bet he can find someone else to please in less than a week. I put her phone in my pocket and left the room. I went to the garage to look at Dad. He opened the hood of his Mustang and plugged his tuner into the port on the engine. His new tuner could transmit information wirelessly to his iPad. The men were like little boys with their toys. With age, toys only became more complex and expensive. Three of our neighbors also gathered around, looking under the hood of Dad's car. When I walked up and started looking at him, he saw me and smiled. The supper ready? He asked. No, Dad, I said. Do not rush. As much as a grown man can be naive, 
My dad was. He seemed happy. He loved his life. When he joked and talked with our neighbors, I felt so embarrassed that I even thought about depriving him of this happiness. He worked so hard to give us a good life. Mom only started working a couple of years ago, when I was old enough to look after myself. She had no secretarial skills and became a volunteer at my high school. She eventually began receiving a salary as she took on more responsibilities, eventually becoming Eddington's secretary. Then I decided, not for the sake of Mom or Eddington, but for the sake of Dad's happiness, not to say anything. I wasn't sure it was the right decision, but at the time, it seemed like the right choice. When I arrived at school the next day, everything started out great. About halfway through the first period, I was called into the principal's office. My wonderful day began to go to hell. I opened the door to Eddington's office. There was no secretary there because my mother quit. Come in and close the door, Melinda, he said. I would prefer to leave it open, I told him. Well, can you just cover her, he said. What we need to talk about must remain confidential. There's nothing to talk about between us, I said. Melinda, what about your future, he said. The colleges you applied to will still be interested in your grades. If your GPA suddenly drops, you may lose several of your options. How can this happen, Mr. Eddington, I asked. Some of your teachers may suddenly begin to evaluate your work more critically, he said, smiling. I assume you already have some kind of solution to this problem, right? I said. He nodded. Melinda, what happened between your mother and I was an accident, but it shouldn't ruin your career or anything else. Can we just... I turned around and slammed his office door so hard it was probably heard in the gym. His eyes became huge. Who the hell do you think you are? I screamed. What are you, Darth Vader? Is this some kind of warning that the Death Star is coming to destroy my home planet? Listen, Dickless, this is the 21st century. Nobody falls for these cheap theatrical tricks anymore. So you won my mother? I'm not as stupid as she must be. I got a B-plus every year that I studied here, except for my first year. Do you know how I got my grades? I worked hard. Nobody gave me anything. If my grades suddenly started to drop, I would approach my teachers with a copy of my work and ask them to reconsider. They would have to show me what was wrong with my work and examples of those who got it right. Second, most of my teachers love me more than they love you, so they wouldn't support your nonsense. Third, you just made yourself an even bigger fool because this. I took my new iPhone out of my pocket and replayed his threat to him. His eyes grew even larger and he sank into a chair. So now I have proof that you tried to keep me quiet, or you will try to convince the teachers to interfere with my grades. I guess it's illegal, isn't it? He nodded his head. So it's not enough that you've been some cheap Casanova here for the last few years. Now you're trying to blackmail kids to hide your connections. Who are you most afraid of, Russell? I asked. This is Mr. Eddington for you, Melinda, he wailed. Mr. is a title or term of respect. I snorted. I have neither one nor the other for you, Russell. I hold your lousy little life and career in my hands. And you know what's the stupidest thing about all this? He shook his head. Before you interrupted my science lesson, I had already agreed with my mom not to tell dad or your wife about this. So what are you most afraid of? Are you afraid that my dad will take revenge on you? Or that you will lose your career? Think about it. I'm going back to class. I walked out into the hallway, still seething with anger, and ran into my favorite teacher, Mrs. Abra. Are you okay, Melinda? She asked. And suddenly, everything became clear to me when I looked into her eyes. Miss Abra was almost a legend in our school. All the boys and all the men were drooling over her. I remember more than once seeing a guy walking down a hallway and catching a glimpse of her, and then crashing into a wall or door. About half the girls in school hated her. It was simply unfair. All these young women are on the cusp of adulthood, like fruit on a vine that is just ripening. Most of them then realize that they have reached a point in their lives where they are in better shape. Time and gravity are their best friends. Then they encounter a woman like Miss Abra, 
who makes them look like clumsy, clumsy little boys. And when you look closely at her, your feeling of despair becomes even deeper. One of the things that most girls learn very early on is that we are all different. Each of us has something remarkable. We learn to emphasize our strengths and downplay our weaknesses. So if you're a girl with an oily face, you know you need to wear sexier clothes to highlight your body and tone down your face. You can also grow your hair longer and playfully style it to cover one eye or the other. If you don't have breasts, you probably have a nice butt or great legs, so you don't wear a bra and wear shorter skirts to highlight what you have. If you don't have a big butt or legs, this is not a problem. You wear low-cut tops and show off to girls. If you are a skinny model with no butt, breasts, and legs, then you will highlight your face. The point is that God gives us all something. The trick is to discover what you've been given and do something about it. Then Ms. Abra comes to ruin everything. Let's start from the top. The woman is simply unfair. She has what I call reactive hair. Her hair is naturally light brown. She told me that when she was growing up, he was called Mouse Brown because he was so reserved and mousy. The women who had it did not stand out in any way. It wasn't a rich, sexy, dark brown that could be called smoldering, nor was it even remotely light. In Ms. Abra's case, her hair reacts to the sun. If there is a lot of sun, it will only take a few days for some of her hair to start turning lighter. It looks amazing. Everyone always thinks that her hair is highlighted. If she wears her hair in a ponytail or styles her hair so that parts of it are not exposed to the sun, those areas seem to darken. And before you know it, her hair has two or three very natural shades mixed together. Half the women I know spend a lot of money trying to achieve a look they don't even think about. Her hair goes down almost to her waist and flutters like the wings of a butterfly. And all that hair does is draw attention to her face. Her face is as beautiful as the rest. She has the bluest eyes. When she talks about math, the worst thing you can do is stare at her. I've heard many boys say that they looked at her and just went into a trance. Her eyes are so blue that you simply forget where you are. I wish she had a huge nose. But her nose is so small that it's like an ornament on her face. And she does the stupidest thing. She has what she considers a flaw. She has a bunch of tiny, almost symmetrical spots of freckles on her nose. She covers them with very light makeup because she hates them. Then, when we walk outdoors and she doesn't wear makeup, all the guys see the freckles and fall in love with her even more. I absolutely hate her mouth. At this point in history, we seem to be fascinated with lips. All over the world, women are getting collagen injections to make their lips thicker and fuller. Then there are women who were born with huge lips. Mrs. Abra has a small mouth, but it has the perfect Cupid's bow shape, which makes it appear larger than it actually is. Her teeth are also very white, and she smiles often. Her smiles are quick, so if something makes her smile in class, the whole room seems warmer. While her head and face are prominent, her body is intimidating. All the parts just don't have to add up to the whole. She doesn't have huge breasts, but that doesn't matter. In fact, last year at a senior pool party, I forgot my swimsuit, and Mrs. Abra told me that since she was an escort only, I could take hers. She said it makes more sense for the students to have fun than the staff. I was sure I couldn't fill her top. Then I noticed it was only a 34C top. At 18 last year, I wore a 36C top. Her breasts are not big at all, but her chest and torso are so small that her average breast size appears large on her. Her waist is also small, only 23 inches, which makes her butt look bigger than it actually is, and she runs every day like my dad, so her legs are intimidating. Mrs. Abra has a few quirks. This woman teaches math and science. She wears a lab coat all day, hiding her body. She also wears very long skirts and blouses that button up to the neck. She also wears those stupid safety glasses all the time, like she forgets she's wearing them. She just doesn't seem to realize how beautiful she is. The worst thing about her is that she is simply the sweetest person you could ever meet. She spends extra time with all of her students and really tries to make sure we understand how useful math and science are for our future careers. I think she has a weakness for shy, unassuming types. You often see her standing there smiling at one of those socially awkward but very smart guys. But she doesn't tolerate any nonsense from the guys on the team. 
she academically benched them more times than anyone cares to remember. When a coach stormed into her lab, angry that one of his players had dropped his GPA in her class to the point that he was on probation and unable to play, she refused to give him any opportunity she didn't. I would give it to someone else. While we're on the subject of coach, he tried very hard to win over Mrs. Abra a couple of years ago. He was rejected outright. She made it clear to him that she was in no way interested in him. She went so far as to remove her name from the list of chaperones for any extracurricular activity in which he participated. Several other teachers also made their own attempts with her. She just didn't seem to want to date anyone. The coach started telling everyone that he knew when she showed no interest in him that she preferred girls. My mother once told me that she heard from one of the other science teachers that Mrs. Abra was once married. Abra was her last name after marriage. Her maiden name was Troy. Her husband was her childhood friend. He joined the army and died during training. The worst thing is that he didn't even get to serve his country, although everyone who signs up makes us proud. For her, it seemed like the biggest waste of her life that her husband had died while training in a logistics procedure. He actually wanted to work for the same company as her father and believed that helping move equipment and resources for the army around the world would be a valuable experience. He also assured her that all he did was essentially warehouse work and receiving. He will stay as far away from bombs and bullets as possible. The soldier, who was not familiar with operating a forklift, crashed into a rack containing boxes of heavy shells. The entire rack collapsed. The boxes were so heavy that they bent the safety cage that protected the forklift operator. He escaped serious injury, but her husband was crushed under literally tons of metal. Are you okay, Melinda? She asked when she saw me leave Eddington's office. Yes, ma'am. I'm fine, I said. But he really gets on my nerves. Trust me, she smiled, revealing her two white teeth. I know this feeling. I never expected to see you leaving the principal's office. I hope you're not in trouble. No, ma'am, I said. But since you mentioned it, I really need some advice. You know some women's wisdom from one generation to another about fashion and style. So you need me to find someone to give you fashion advice? She said. Well, I guess we could ask Sandy. Do you know Mrs. Delacroix? She knows all about Parisian fashions and everything. She also watches all these TV shows about style and models. See what I'm talking about. This woman has no idea how beautiful she is. She wanted to help me by asking another woman who was not as beautiful as her. Mrs. Abra, I said. I wanted to get advice from you. From me? She smiled. But you are much more beautiful than me. I don't even know where to begin to advise you. Now, if you needed help with math, something you've never had, then... You are the perfect person to help me, I said. Okay, she smiled. I will do my best, but you will have to help me too. What do you need, ma'am? I asked. First and second year students don't sign up for a nature hike. She frowned. They don't seem to find anything exciting about science. They tend to do everything on the computer. For them, running through the forest is not much fun. Melinda, you're very popular, and maybe if you let people know you'd be joining, I'd have more volunteers, she said shyly. God, this woman is crazy. All she had to do was take off her lab coat and those funny glasses and make an announcement and every guy in school would show up. If the guys show up, the girls will come too. The problem was that the new students had not yet realized how hot she was. I won't just tell people, I said. I will be there. Is it okay if I bring a friend? Of course, she said, smiling. The more people, the merrier. I need as many people as possible roaming the forest and bringing me samples. I went back to class that day, and when I got home after school, I ran into my mom again. Hello, darling, she said with a smile. I looked at her as if she had gone crazy. I was 18 years old, and she greeted me at the door with a plate of milk and cookies. Hi, Teresa, I said venomously. I thought we agreed not to talk to each other. Melinda, this is stupid, she said. We are family. You were taken from my womb. You are a part of me, so we should at least try to get along. Teresa, have you ever heard the expression, you can't go home? I asked. She nodded her head in confusion. 
What does this have to do with us? She asked. Well, you know how people are born in a certain area and grow up there, and then later become famous and move away. When they return home later, everything in the area has changed. Everything they thought was great is either destroyed or was never that great. I smiled. I still don't understand how it is, she began. Teresa, you said it yourself. I was taken from your womb, but after what I saw yesterday, I would never go back there. All your life you've given me a set of rules to follow, but you don't follow them yourself. I have nothing more to learn from you. I don't respect you anymore, so there's no point in our communication. But Melinda, we're not just a group of people working together in an office or a sports team. We're a family. We have to forgive each other when we make mistakes, she said. If you don't like my decision, we can always just tell Dad and let him decide if he wants to forgive you, I said. In my opinion, you cheated on a man who loves you so much that he does everything possible to make your life better. What has Eddington ever done for you? When you're sick, is he the one who sits by your bed, massaging your forehead? Is he the one who has supported you all these years? What did he even do for you to make you betray your husband? I asked. Nothing, she said. So, if we do it your way, I said, and I will tell Dad what you did, not only will I still not talk to you, but you will also lose your husband and also your daughter. Right? She nodded. Teresa, just give up while you're behind, I said. I can't believe the girl I raised is so unforgiving, she said. Her voice trembled and tears rolled down her cheeks. Teresa, stop crying. I said. You said it yourself yesterday. I'm daddy's daughter. I dealt with you gently. If you were someone else, if the person who hurt my dad was someone I didn't love, I would have ruined his life. You got off easy. If you don't do anything stupid again, you can stay married to him. But of course, if someone else doesn't know about what you did, if I catch you again, even with someone else, it won't be pretty. I stayed in my room until dad came home. Then I went downstairs and had dinner with him. Dad relaxed for a while after dinner, and then I asked him if he wanted to go for a walk or a light jog. Just as we were getting ready to leave, my mom asked if we wanted her to come with us. You don't like to run, I said, smiling at her. I can ride your old bike, she smiled. So we could all be together. My bike has a flat tire, I said. But if you really want to listen to me talk about school events and try to convince Dad to come to some of them, that's fine. Maybe since you're there, we can talk about yesterday, too. Well, if my bike has a flat tire, there's no way I can go with you, she suddenly said. My ass is too fat to run. I love your ass, honey, my dad said. He kissed her, and I wanted to vomit. My mom smiled at me after he kissed her and patted her ass. I think she wanted to consider it a victory. When my dad got up to change into his gym clothes, she smiled at me. See, Melinda, he wasn't hurt. He still loves me just as much. And believe it or not, I still love him too. I would never hurt him. He's the man I intend to be with. Spend the rest of my life. All I wanted was a little excitement. It will be very exciting when he divorces your cheating ass, I said, smiling at her. She just shook her head and went to the kitchen to clean. When Dad and I ran, we talked. He was telling me about some problems at work, and what he wanted to do with his Mustang. I told him about the post-harvest dance and the scientific expedition for Mrs. Abra. I nudged him a little, and he agreed to accompany me. When he told me that he would make my mom come too, I told him that I had already asked her, and she had other plans. So when Saturday came, Dad and I got up early and grabbed breakfast on the go. We were still eating it when Mrs. Abra pulled up in her car. She had one of those new Pontiacs, a reissue of the classic GTO. The car came out a few years ago and wasn't as big of a hit as GM expected. It was too similar to G6 and G8. And while the performance was great, it didn't look like what muscle car enthusiasts wanted. My dad immediately jumped out of his Mustang and slowly walked around the car. He looked at everything. He looked at the wheels and brakes and dual exhaust pipes and then leaned back and looked at the body lines. Mrs. Abra got out of the car and walked towards me. This is my dad, I said. He's a car fan. I noticed, she said. Dad, come meet my teacher, I shouted. 
You don't have to worry about anything. Your car is much more powerful no matter what you're trying to figure out. As soon as I called him, a van with a bunch of guys pulled up. Coach Cleats and several guys from the team got out and started looking around. Hi, my dad said shyly. He extended his hand. I'm Jim Carson. I'm Keith's dad. Elena, she said. She shook his hand warmly and looked into his eyes. My dad looked away. I noticed that she tried to hold his hand for a split second longer than she should have. It wasn't much, but it was a start. Can I ask you? My dad started before Coach Cleats ran up to us. Hello, beauty, he said. I got my guys to come help with your problem. More and more cars pulled up and children got out of them. Some brought their parents or younger siblings. Well, I don't see how they can help by playing football, she said. And if they don't want to be here, then they shouldn't. I need water and soil samples. I also need to know where they came from. I need leaves and plant samples. If they mess it up, I'll have to start over. They can handle it, beauty, he said. And you and I can go look for something together. See you later, Elena, my dad said. Elena, huh? Coach Cleet said. Well, Elena, let's get started. My name is Mrs. Abra, coach, she said. I don't like being called pretty, and we're not on friendly terms. I really don't understand why you came today, so I would really appreciate it if you could keep an eye on your boys so they don't trample on the vegetation while we're here. The goal is to study nature, not destroy it. The coach turned red and looked ready to explode when one of his guys in the background whispered, Ooh, frozen. I shook my head and followed Mrs. Abra. The morning and early afternoon were very eventful. I naturally teamed up with my dad, and we went through all the forests, finding what we were assigned to find. Mrs. Abra was very excited and often asked us where we got a particular sample and followed us around to see it for herself. It was interesting to watch her and my dad being together. I could see that, if given the chance, they would work together. But the funny thing was that they were almost never alone. Many mothers and their sons or daughters tried to talk to my dad. At the same time, many men tried to approach Mrs. Abra. Finally, late in the afternoon, the school bus driver arrived in a van to take all the samples back to the school, and Miss Abra thanked everyone and told them to stop. She told us that the day was a success and that the school science program thanked us all. Everyone got into their cars and left. I was ready to go too. I needed to think seriously. In the morning, I saw Russell Eddington appear, but he didn't stay long. I think when he saw me and my father, he left. I also saw my mother's car. I wasn't sure if she was there to see Eddington or to find out what I was doing, but she drove past and continued on her way. Perhaps it was a coincidence. I had several problems to solve and at the same time I was starving. Jim, Ms. Abra said as we got into the car. First of all, I want to thank you for coming. You and Melinda were my best lab assistants today. And secondly, just before everyone came, you were going to ask me something, weren't you? My father looked at her shyly, and she smiled. Suddenly, I wasn't so hungry anymore. Things might not be as bad as I thought after all. Come on, Dad. Invite her to come and eat with us, I thought. It's something personal, my father said shyly. Jim. You spent Saturday digging in the dirt for me, she said. So ask me. Could you, um, show me, he began. I kind of thought my dad was above it, but my mom sure as hell wasn't. Ms. Abra's eyes also narrowed, but my father continued to rapidly plunge into disaster. I'd really like to see, he continued. The engine, in that GTO. It is expected to be a 5.7 liter V8 engine. This is the same engine that was in the Corvette that year. I am curious. Why does it only produce 350 horsepower? What year is this? Because the Yo 4 had 350 horsepower and the Yo 6 had 400. While both are very respectable, you'd think with such a larger engine you'd get more out of it. I mean, my Mustang is only 5.0 liters. And it produces 462 horsepower without forced air and... I have no idea what you're talking about, she laughed. But you can look at it all you want. 
She was still smiling at him and shaking her head as she got into the car and opened the hood. Dad picked it up, put the support in place, and began to look at what the guys were looking at there. Ms. Abra got out of the car and stood next to him. Unfortunately, Coach Klitz also jumped off the bus and headed to the car. What's wrong with your car, Bob? Uh, hell, Miss Abra? He asked angrily. Nothing, she said. Do you have somewhere to stay? No, I'm alone tonight, he said. So what are we looking at? It's a motor, isn't it? From here I can see what's wrong with him. You need to have your carburetor repaired. Maybe we can get away with just cleaning it. I think we have the fluid we need on the bus. Hmm, this engine doesn't have a carburetor, my father said. It's fuel injection. Exactly, said Coach Klitz. I was going to pour starting fluid into the injector. Well, I'll let you guys continue. If you can't fix it, call me. You still have my number, right? Yes, I have your number, Ms. Abra said sarcastically. She turned back to look at the engine with my dad as, frozen again, came from the bus to a burst of laughter. Dad, eat, I said a few minutes later. We said goodbye to Ms. Abra and headed home. When we returned home because it was Saturday, my mother had not prepared dinner. When we entered, she looked at us hesitantly. She walked up to Dad, hugged him, and then looked at me. I kept a neutral expression. Melinda, today is Saturday, dear. Don't you have a date or something? She asked. Mom, you know Dean and I went out last night, I said, and we'll probably figure something out tomorrow afternoon, but on Saturday night he has to help his father clean the church. Remember, I helped too, just to be close to Dean, but his mother annoyed me. Why do moms always create problems? Mom immediately went into a defensive position. I wasn't trying to cause trouble, honey, she said. I was just wondering if you were busy with something. You are a beautiful girl. You should enjoy life. This is your last year at school. You'll have to get serious about your studies next year if you want to get into a good law school. You work hard, and I want you to be able to rest well, too. Mom, life is not always about fun. I had a great time bonding with my dad today. It was a lot of fun, and we also helped one of my teachers. Like you said, I'm going away to college next year, so I want to spend as much time as possible with my dad. Besides, didn't you always tell me that family comes first? And you also told me that sometimes you need to do like Tammy Wynette and support your man. I know it's bad that Dean is stuck with help at the church. Neither of us are really religious, but his parents are into it. He doesn't want to offend them, so we go along with it. Since I'm in a relationship with him, I have to follow the program. Remember, you taught me to put my relationships first. She turned pale when I threw her own bullshit at her. I like the way you phrase it, Mom, I said. Girls who get involved with many guys are usually left without one of their own. She looked like she had been punched in the stomach. Well, I didn't cook dinner, she said, changing the subject. I was thinking that if you were going out, maybe your dad and I would just order pizza and watch pay TV and see what happens. That sounds good, I said. I grabbed my dad's hand and pulled him out of the kitchen. I'll order pizza, Dad. You turn on the big screen and find us a movie. Please don't choose one of those sappy love stories that end tragically when one of the lovers dies or cheats. When Dad came to the door a short time later to pick up the pizza from the delivery guy, he ended up talking about his Mustang with him. My mother took this opportunity to speak again. It would be nice if you would let me spend the evening alone with your dad, she said plaintively. How can I fix the situation if you never leave us alone? Three things, I said caustically. You need to get yourself tested for STDs before you even dream of touching him again. Number two, I saw you driving past the park at the same time as your lover, or shortly after. If I find out you've spoken to him, all bets are off. And three, I thought we shouldn't fucking be talking to each other. I had barely finished the last sentence when Dad put the pizza in front of us. I'll get drinks for all of us, he said. Mom and I smiled and nodded our heads. She even reached out and gently patted my shoulder. I'm sure my dad didn't notice anything. He was pretty calm unless someone was threatening his family or talking about his car. As soon as he went into the kitchen... We were at each other's throats again. If you ever touch me again, you'll be divorced before you can pull your hand away, I snapped. Melinda, you need to give me a chance to make peace. I'm not your enemy, 
I know you and your father decided that you would be a lawyer, but you treat me like I'm a criminal. Even criminals are innocent until proven guilty, she said. Mom, you had an agreement, let's call it a contract, with your father. Part of this agreement required you to be faithful to him, didn't it? I asked. But, she muttered. No buts, I said. Didn't that require loyalty and trust? Yes, she said. You broke it, I said. We don't need any proof because I was there. I caught you red-faced and red-handed. Is this also true? Yes, she spat. But can't I make amends for what I did? When someone steals something, they give it back and apologize and then move on. Mom, you're either crazy or stuck at three years old, I said. When someone robs a bank, even if he returns the money, he goes to jail. In that case, how can you compensate for the damage? Once again, I treat you much better than you deserve. I had to tell Dad everything. You could live with your grandma again right now. And Mom, you won't stay with the house. I know this most of all. People think that the house goes to the woman. Dad paid the mortgage himself. You're not even listed on it. And in most cases, the house actually goes to the parent and child. Since I'll be off to college soon, I might add that if Dad pays for it, the judge will find me living in this house until I graduate. Make no mistake, Teresa. I am much older than the age when any judge can ask my opinion. And there is no doubt which parent I would prefer to live with. I smiled at her. So I see that you live with your grandmother. And you know that she will be very angry with you when she finds out why you got divorced. Dad will probably waive child support and your half of my school expenses since you can't afford it. Even if you went back to damn Eddington, I forgot that you can't do this because in the three days that you were gone, he already got a younger and prettier secretary. So at 38, you are left without any skills except those you may have behind you. You're living in your mom's basement with debt piling up. I'm sure dad won't let me get kicked out of school for this. You don't pay your share. And he probably won't keep you on child support. Your lawyer will likely negotiate the deal. Dad doesn't have to pay you child support in exchange for you not paying child support and him paying for all my college expenses. Does this seem fair to you? No, she said loudly. I would have gone broke. I don't have any skills. I dropped out of college to have a child who no longer values me. I made one mistake. Why should I lose my home, my family, my marriage, and my daughter? For one mistake? Mom, forgetting to add bleach is a mistake. Having sex with another man in my dad's bed is a criminal offense, I said. My facial features were tense. When I spoke to her, acid dripped from my words. As far as I understand, Dad, I fell silent when he entered the room with a tray. He placed a tall, fluted glass of white wine in front of his mother. I also had a bottle of wild cherry Pepsi and Dos Equis Amber in front of me for himself. He sat down on the sofa, himself at the far end, Mom in the middle, and me at the opposite end. I stood up to grab the cable remote control, and when I returned to the couch, I leaned over and hugged my mother. This shocked the hell out of her after the conversation she had just had. Then I squeezed between them and put my feet on the coffee table as we sat down to watch the movie. I spent Sunday morning thinking about my problem. I found it strange that an 18-year-old girl who was still a virgin was trying to teach her almost 40-year-old mother a moral lesson. All my life, my father protected me, and this time, I had to protect him. I've seen enough of my friends go through their parents' divorce to know that it's usually the parent who got cheated on who gets the worst of it. When Daniel's father cheated on her mother with his secretary, they divorced. Her mother received a house and a monthly check, but she became withdrawn and depressed. She started drinking and just became a different woman. This also affected Danielle. Her mother's self-esteem and confidence were destroyed. Meanwhile, her father married his secretary. He got her pregnant, started his new family with a woman half his age, and moved on with his life. Somehow the money he had to pay Danielle's mother was not enough for the pain he caused her. She will also only receive child support for five years. It seemed like such a waste. She was trapped in this house, full of tainted memories, wondering what she had done wrong. She was too depressed to move on with her life or even try to find a job. Maybe that's why I was so angry with my mother. I didn't want my father to go through this. If their marriage was going to end, I needed to make sure he got back on his feet. My attempt to set him up with Miss Abra failed. 
My father didn't even notice how hot she was. Hell, he could barely ask her to look at the engine of her damn car. And Miss Abra was no help either. I could tell she was interested in my father, but she too was too shy to take any action against him. This just highlighted one of the problems I had with the Bible. If the meek inherit the earth, they would not know what to do with it, and someone else would take it away from them. I needed to find someone who would be more aggressive towards my father. My mother didn't realize it, but nothing we talked about really mattered. I just pulled her along with me until I was ready to throw her overboard. Did I feel guilty for lying to her? Of course not. She didn't feel guilty or even think there was anything wrong with what she did until she got caught. Then I realized that I already knew who the ideal person for my dad was. Danielle's mom would be perfect for him. She wasn't as sweet as Miss Abra, but who is? Mrs. Kinney was still slimmer and better built than my mother, and she looked pretty too. Or it would be if I could get her to put on makeup and cover up the bags under her eyes. She could help her dad get over her mom, and her dad could help her get over the divorce and feel like a woman again. I don't know why I didn't think of this first. Monday was a hectic day at school. Mr. Eddington avoided me. I tried going to his office and telling him I saw him in the park on Saturday, but it seemed like every time I saw him he was gone, although I saw him go to lunch with his new secretary. During lunch I met Miss Abra. I think she was looking for me. Hi, Melinda, she said. So what service did you need from me? I just wanted you to help me pick out an outfit for the Harvest Festival dance, I said. I would be glad, she smiled. But I told you that... I knew exactly where she was going. Miss Abra, you are beautiful, I said. You are probably the sexiest woman I have ever seen. Guys instantly go crazy for you. Before I could finish my thought, she said something under her breath that stopped me in my tracks. I'd rather have your help then. Please forgive me for this because I'm sure she's your friend, but some fat art teacher who thinks she's America's next top model, I said. We looked at each other strangely. I'm really sorry, she said. I didn't want to say it out loud. I didn't mean for it to sound that way. I didn't mean to say what I said about your friend, I said. We need to talk, I said. Can you take me home after school? You can come over to my house and see what outfit I choose and then... Maybe we can have a snack and talk about what you said. I promise that what we talk about won't go any further than just the two of us. She looked nervous, but nodded her head and left. I was so excited. When I told her how attractive she was, she whispered, It's a shame your father doesn't think so. After this conversation, I was so excited that I could not sit still until the end of class. I noticed that my concentration was slipping and I kept looking at my watch. Finally, 3.30 came. I packed my books and practically ran to Miss Abra's laboratory. As usual, there was a group of students waiting to talk to her about something, most of them guys who just wanted to look at her. I noticed that after Saturday's walk, she had a much larger following among the freshmen and sophomores, so we were able to do more than just collect samples. This got me thinking about a few things. First of all, I didn't think I would want to be so beautiful. This will probably be a pain in the ass. All sorts of guys you're not interested in are constantly hanging around, trying to get you to pay attention to them. It got me thinking about Saturday and the coldness she showed towards Coach. I think this helped me understand her better. She was very polite to most of the male volunteers, but also wary. She kept a neutral expression and avoided smiling too much. But with the coach, she seemed to use every opportunity to push him away. Then I remembered that the coach took every opportunity to act as if there was some kind of relationship between them. He called her baby. And then he tried to call her by name. She pointedly rejected both of these attempts. Then I realized that things were probably worse for her than I could have imagined. But on the other hand, I clearly missed her interest in my father. She told him her name, and when we were ready to leave, she called him back. She also allowed him to ask her a personal question, although my father's idea of what is personal is stupid. She then stood next to him as close as possible without even touching him as he looked at the engine of her car. I also remembered the smile on her face as they stood there. This, of course, caused the coach to come in and make a fool of himself again. 
Remembering this sequence of events made me seriously think about trying to get her to do something with my father. I have to admit that my father, although not a weakling, is not very aggressive either. With all the Toms, Dicks, and Harrys in the area looking at her with admiration at first sight, what does the relationship between them mean to my father? Melinda, are you okay? asked Ms. Abra. I looked up and realized that we were alone in the room. I was so deep in my thoughts that I didn't even realize that she had gotten rid of all her students and was waiting for me. Sorry, ma'am, I said. I was just thinking. You do that a lot, don't you? She smiled. That's probably why you're such a good student. We got into her car and I decided to test it. As we pulled out of the parking lot, she started the engine and the car took off, leaving a spray of gravel behind us. Not bad, I said. She looked at me. Your car has power, but it's also smooth. My father couldn't have done it if everyone in the area hadn't ducked out of the way. I could probably drive this car, I said. You don't drive your dad's car? She asked. While I was talking about this, I was analyzing her voice and everything she did. Her hands gripped the steering wheel tighter, and there was much more tension in her legs. There was also the fact that I was talking about cars in general. She was the one who raised my father's Mustang. Well, he let me drive her, I said. I'm the only person he's ever allowed to do this. But this car scares the life out of me. Pardon the expression, but it's true. My dad treats this car like he treats his second child. But this is a cruel thing. If you don't turn on the traction control, forget about it. It burns rubber every time it starts. His previous Mustang had a manual transmission. The clutch was so tight that it was difficult for me to change gears. This car is automatic. My dad must have the reflexes of a racing driver because this car goes 35 mph without even stepping on the gas. I don't know how my dad manages it on residential streets. And on the highway, every time you look at the speedometer, it's scary. I've only driven for a little over a year, so I don't like driving fast. I took her on the highway once, and I probably thought I was going about 60. Our family car shakes a little when you drive faster than 65. I noticed that I was overtaking cars as if they were standing still. And I looked at the speedometer, realizing that I was going 90 and the car was solid as a rock. She was actually purring. This horse loves to run. By the time we got to the house, she pulled into the driveway behind my mom's car. I left, and we went up to my room. I took out my chosen outfits, and she looked at them all before saying anything. They are all good, she began. But I think what will really make the difference is the person in them. Melinda, you can look good in any of these outfits and will probably be one of the best-dressed women at the dance. I would rule out these two, unless you have something that can be used as a stole. Even when it is warm during the day, at night, the dance becomes quite chilly. The sound of our voices must have carried because my mother looked into the room and then entered. Hello, she said. I didn't know you were already home, Melinda. Or that you have a guest. Mrs. Abra, good to see you. Hello, Teresa. Mrs. Abra said. Call me Elena. I just realize I haven't seen you for about a week. You're on vacation? No, my mother said, looking at me. I quit. Can I offer you something to eat or drink? No, thank you, Teresa. We're going to go out and get something to eat. I didn't hear that you were resigning. We usually have a party when someone leaves. The decision had to be very sudden. I don't think anyone knows about this yet. But on the other hand, I'm not sure I could have worked with Russell as much as you have. This man makes my skin crawl. He's worse than Coach Cleats. Every time I stand in front of him, I think he's trying to imagine what I would look like without clothes. Women. You must have stones in your head, or you must be a real slut to be with someone like him. I don't envy his wife. My mom looked nervous. Well, have fun, she said, and went back to her business. I tried on both outfits, and we agreed that the blue dress fit better. After that, I changed back into my clothes, and we headed to Wendy's. As we sat down for hamburgers, she asked her first question. Melinda, if your mom is home, why didn't you just ask her to help you pick out outfits? She asked. We'll come back to this, I said. Can we talk about the important things first? Fine. She smiled, looking at me with amusement on her face. Melinda, you will be a great prosecutor. You have the ability to see the essence of things. I nodded. 
I'm really not trying to be cruel or hurtful, ma'am, but this is important to me. So forgive me if I step on your feet, okay? I said. She was still looking at me with a smile. You like my dad, don't you? I asked. Suddenly she choked on her French fries. She took a long sip of her soda and then looked at me with wide eyes. Of course not, she muttered. I'm not a destroyer of families. Your dad is a married man. I just looked at her. She nervously picked at her fries. No one will ever know what we talked about here, I said, still looking at her. Melinda, I'm 33 years old, she began. I've only been in love once. It ended tragically and I've been on the sidelines ever since. It wasn't that I didn't want to move on, I just didn't. A few years ago I returned to my hometown and looked at my in-laws. I guess I got lonely and I thought maybe an apple from the same tree would work where nothing else had worked. He had three brothers. The eldest was a drunkard who beat his wife. The youngest, who was five years younger than me, was a drug addict. And the middle one, who served in the army with my husband, is in prison. For some time I wondered what my life would be like when he returned from the army. Would he have become just like his brothers? Or was he a special person? I guess I'll never know. My sister-in-law tells me that Robert, that's the older brother, was an angel for the first five years of their marriage. As he got older, she said he changed and became more like their father. She never expected him to hit her the first time. She told me to hold on to my good memories, but I got the impression that she thought he would have changed too. I wanted to move on, but I react to most men the same way you react to a tree. I'm not stupid, Melinda. I know I'm attractive, but so are you. Can't you tell by the look of a guy if you really like him or if he just wants sex with you? I nodded, and she was right. I've spent my whole life trying to overcome my appearance, she said. I had to work twice as hard as everyone else to prove that I was interested in science. In college, no one wanted me in their group-for-group -group assignments because everyone thought I was stupid. The only guy who watched it, I married him. Melinda, he was funny and shy, and he danced to different music. Do you know what he told me the first time? I shook my head. I was in the library with a book in my hands. He came up and sat down next to me. He began to write a term paper. His work was supposed to be printed, but he wrote it by hand. I found out later that he always did things the way he wanted, no matter, no matter what. He was a terrible typist, but he had great handwriting. Eventually, we started spending a lot of time exchanging glances. Finally, he just looked at me and said, God, you're so ugly, he said with the biggest smile on his face. Shall we have lunch together? If I'm so ugly, why do you want to show off with me? I asked. My father told me never to fall in love with a beautiful woman, he said. And since I want to marry you more than anything in life, you must be ugly so that I don't break my promise to my father. He constantly surprised me, she said, all the time until the end and no one had such an influence on me since he died until I met your father. He is such a contradictory person. He is very handsome, but instead of being arrogant, he is humble. He is clearly confident in himself, but unlike the other dads who were there on Saturday, he didn't stand with other guys discussing golf. He spent the entire day running through the woods with his daughter. You could see the joy on his face when you found different leaves or insects. It seemed like every damn guy was coming up to me, like I had to fall on my face and bow to them because they came up and said some cliché thing. I guess I must feel desperate because I'm a widow. She sighed and began munching on her fries again. Melinda, I think I'm desperate. My biological clock is ticking like hell. But I intend to get married once again in my life. When I find a partner, it will be for the rest of my life. So it has to be the right person. And since you said that this will stay between us and I trust you, yes, I really like your dad, but you have nothing to worry about. I'm not the type of woman who goes after married men. Besides, he's more interested in my car than me. The whole time we were talking, I was afraid to breathe. I had never felt this way before. I wanted his touch so much, but I didn't dare. She looked a little sad as she ate some more of her hamburger. But as sad as she looked, she seemed more relaxed. It was as if being able to tell someone about it had lifted a lot of tension off her shoulders. I'll help you, I said as she hung her head and munched on a hamburger. She stopped chewing and choked again. 
I had to stop talking while she was eating before I killed her. Melinda, he's married, and your mother... He's cheating on him. I spat loudly. My mother was entertaining Russell Eddington in my father's bed when I caught them. She doesn't deserve him. I won't let her hurt anyone. They are getting divorced. That's why she had to quit her damn job. I can't stand her. That's why I don't ask her for advice on anything. And my father will be heartbroken when he finds out. The best way for me to do this is to find someone who is better for him. Someone who can help him get through the pain he'll feel when he finds out, and then help him move on. You are perfect for this role, ma'am. And the reason he hasn't noticed you is because he really thinks he's being faithful to a woman who deserves him. No matter how beautiful you are, my father is simply not a cheater. We just need to get you together a few times. I returned home, feeling better than I have since this all started. I wanted to pull out a cigar and say, I like it when a plan comes to fruition. I guess that's why I was surprised when the wheels of my brilliant plan started to fall off. Melinda, what the hell are you playing at? The mother asked angrily. You're right. I saw you in the park on Saturday. I was afraid that you would tell your father. I saw you introduce him to math and science Barbie. Then you actually brought that bitch into my house. If you need help choosing your clothes, that's my job. I am your mother. Did you know she prefers girls? She asked. I started laughing out loud. She doesn't prefer girls, I laughed. You probably heard it from Eddington, didn't you? No, she's not like that. She's just picky about her men. What do you mean? She asked curiously. I knew I had it. This wasn't what I planned, but it will probably work. Do you remember our conversation about how you reconcile with Dad? I asked. She nodded excitedly. The only way to even things out is for Daddy to have sex with someone else too. Then everything will be smooth and we can become a family again. I'm tired of all this anger, Mom. I miss you. So if your father has sex with her a few times, it will all be over and you'll never tell him, she asked. And you will forgive me too. That was the plan, I said. But it won't work. Dad didn't even look at her twice. He was more interested in her car than she was. I'll help you she said. No one knows your father better than I do. We just need to bring them together in enough situations where they actually have to touch each other. Then, when we're ready to lower the boom, we need to get your father drunk. Let me think for a moment while I prepare dinner. We can do it. She smiled widely and held out her hand for me to give her a high five. God, she's so stupid, I thought as she left the room. The next day at school, I told Mrs. Abra, or Helena, as I called her since we were partners in crime, about the new developments. I also told her about my mom's first idea, which was to get the two of them together. We had to have a party that was also a practice dance for the harvest dance. This was mainly done so that younger school children could learn to dance before the big festival. Most of the children were excellent at dance club style dances, but had little experience in partner dances like those performed at a harvest festival. I convinced Helena to sign up as a chaperone and told her that I would work to get my father to do it too. Once there, I got them to dance with each other, and we were all one step closer to getting the two of them together. The funny thing is that this idea came to my mother. As the evening of the practice dance approached, I noticed that my mother was becoming more and more worried. I still didn't talk to her much, but I talked to her about the plan. She had some interesting ideas about what to do after the practice dance. Either way, there was magic in the air on the night of the practice dance. I let my mom put a flower in my hair while I waited for Dean to pick me up. Both Dad and I were shocked that Mom wasn't coming. I actually got angry and pulled her aside. I actually thought it would be cool to invite her over here and make her watch Daddy dance with Helena. I wanted to enjoy the way she squirmed, watching as a woman who was younger than her, better built than her, and more beautiful than her, did everything she could to excite my father right in front of her eyes. Both Helena and I agreed that my mother simply did not love my father. Despite all her statements, she refused. The first blow was her infidelity. If she loved him, she wouldn't cheat on him. The second blow was her refusal to confess everything when she was caught. The final blow was the fact that not only was she willing to let him have sex with another woman, she was willing to help with planning and executing the event. 
She had nothing to do with my father. If she loved him as much as she claimed, she should have cried at the thought of him having sex with someone else. I looked at her in the kitchen, my dad upstairs, and Dean waiting in the living room. Why don't you go? I asked. Go upstairs and get dressed now. Melinda, you don't want me there, she said. Think about it, honey. You have an analytical mind. You know how shy your father is. There's no way he'll dance with Helena if I'm there. He will consider this an insult to me. And secondly, you'll have to convince him that Helena is lonely and upset because no one will dance with her anymore. Besides that, he won't approach her, no matter how beautiful she is. I had to admit that the bitch was right. I didn't even think about how to persuade him to dance with her. What I didn't realize was that my mother had outsmarted me. Damn, I was only 18. I couldn't keep track of all the factors. And she was mean. When Dean and I were driving to the dance, he tried to start a conversation. Although my thoughts were busy with other things, there were so many things that could go wrong. I reached out and took Dean's hand. He's so lucky. His calm nature reminded me of my father. This was one of the reasons why I loved him so much. Dean had the same capacity for commitment to a cause, idea, or person that my father had. But unlike my father, Dean would never have to worry about the woman he loved cheating on him. Other than the fact that the parking lot filled up after dark, the school remained unchanged. We stopped at Dean's house so his dad could take a photo of us while his mom chewed gum. Okay, I'll take that back. It was insulting to imply that his mother was a cow. In fact, I want to apologize to the cows who were offended by my heartless comparison. As we approached the door, I heard the powerful roar of the Engen and smiled. Wow, that must be your dad's Mustang, Dean said. I laughed and shook my heed. No, honey, that's not my father, I said. A few seconds later, we heard an even lower and louder hum and the driver started the engine as he pulled into the parking lot. This is my dad's Mustang, I said. The two cars pulled together and actually parked next to Dean's Toyota. I'm sure most people thought it was a coincidence that my dad's GTO and Mustang GT pulled up at the same time and parked next to each other, but to me it was more of an omen. I saw this as a sign from the authorities that they not only sanctioned, but also blessed this union. I watched as Miss Abra looked across the car at my father. My father fiddled with his keys. Out of nowhere, Coach Klitz ran up to Helena's car and tried to open the door for her. Since the door was locked, he tried again and again. She rolled down the window and asked what he was doing. I'm just opening your door, baby, he smiled. I'm trying to be a damn gentleman here. I figured since we're going to spend most of the evening rubbing bellies, and if we're lucky, most of the night after that, we might as well start off on a good note. We don't start on any note, she said coldly. We don't even start the same song. Your comment about belly rubs is inappropriate in the workplace. I could easily file a sexual harassment case against you if... Hello, Helena, my father said. I hate to bother you, but I was hoping you could show me where the gym is. Aren't you the football coach? He asked Coach Klitz. He extended his hand to shake. I heard the team is looking good. People are saying you guys might even win a game this year. The locks on Helena's car opened and she got out of the car. It was as if every head in the parking lot turned at the same time. Helena wore a white sheath dress that hugged her curves. She had a string of pearls around her neck, and in her hair, like mine, she had a large flower tucked into one side. She looked my dad in the eyes and said, Hi, Jim. I'd like to show you around. In fact, they like it when escorts work in teams. One of us will cope with the girl and the other with the boy. Just let me grab my purse. She sat back in the car and grabbed an expensive-looking white leather clutch. She took my father's arm and they entered the building together. I grabbed Dean's hand and pulled him along. I needed to see what happened next. I noticed that a lot of people were looking at them both when they entered. Helena might as well have painted a target on herself. Most of the women there immediately hated her. She set new paradigms as soon as she entered the building. Its effect was especially pronounced among women. Both she and my father looked like they belonged together. I was proud of the way my father stepped in to help her with the trainer, who was still angrily trailing behind them. Okay, we're here and you're safe, my father smiled. I had a bad feeling when he turned to leave. Jim, 
she said quietly. Where are you going? Um, I just wanted to get you away from the guy who was hitting on you, he said. I'm going to go check on Keith. She took his hand again. You saved me, so now you're stuck with me. Also, you did a great job with Melinda. It's time to give her some space. She is a smart, independent woman. I think we're the ones who need a little TLC. My father looked embarrassed, but sat down at the table with her. Then what I thought was another disruption to my plan happened. We all heard the sound of a car engine running, coming from my father's jacket. He smiled and took out his iPhone. Helena looked across from me, and I shrugged. Oh, hi, honey, he said. Are you feeling better? Then he laughed, listened, and fell silent. I was sure that he would run to her house and make a checkmate. This bitch beat me up, but at least I got him to pay attention to Helena. He motioned for me to come to him. I have problems, he said. Your mom says Helena is depressed because only idiots ask Helena out. I saw this coach, honey. He's an asshole. Your mom says I should dance with her. How the hell am I supposed to do this? You can do it, Dad, I said. Just be yourself. After all, you're only asking her to dance, not to marry you. For some reason, the DJ wasn't fully tuned in yet, but he played the song and a lot of people headed to the dance floor. Dean and I went dancing, and as he spun me around the floor, I couldn't help but keep an eye on our table. As Dean and I returned to the table, a man came up and asked Helena if she wanted to dance. I'd love to, she said cheerfully, but I already promised someone all my dances, although he hasn't asked me yet. He must be an idiot, the man said. Before Elena could say anything, the DJ played another song. We heard a howling female voice with a beautiful Irish accent. The light of day is slowly fading. Time stands still with you. I'm only waiting for you, a light touch, and I feel weak. Come on, Jim, they're playing our song, Elena said. Do we have a song? asked my father. When they hit the dance floor, I listened to the song. When the singer reached the chorus, I couldn't help but smile a little. Elena knew exactly what she was doing. So keep going. Keep going. Come on. Leave me breathless. Tempt me. Tease me. Until I can't deny it loving feeling. May I long for your kiss. Come on. Keep going. Come on. Leave me breathless. They danced. And although my father seemed confused at first, a smile appeared on his face. I realized that everything would be okay. Looking at Elena, I knew that he was in good hands. She began to dance with him very formally, but very slowly, but purposefully, pulled him closer. When they weren't dancing together, they sat at the table and laughed and talked. Elena was in seventh heaven. She was literally beaming. Men from all sides tried to catch her gaze, but she kept both eyes strictly on my father. She caught my gaze and silently whispered, breathless. Even though my poor dad didn't realize it, he was having an almost perfect first date. We had only been there for about three hours when the fantasy ended. Someone must have put something in the punch because Coach Cleats was angry and drunk. He headed towards our table and Elena. Elena spoke and leaned towards my father. The huge figure of Coach Cleats loomed over them. He stood there, glaring as they laughed. Elena, get up and dance with me, he demanded. This guy has been monopolizing you all damn night. You're wrong, Mr. Cleats, she said. I monopolized it. Can you imagine how many women wanted to dance with him? And he rejected them all. As anger flashed across the coach's face, my father stood up and stood between Elena and the coach. Listen, buddy, the coach seethed. I know it's hard, and I feel sorry for you. But just because Eddington is having fun with your wife, that doesn't mean you can interfere in my affairs with my woman, and I... My father's fist slammed into the coach's face so quickly that he didn't even see what was coming at him. The blow was so powerful that it lifted the coach into the air and knocked him down. A mixture of confusion, anger, and pain competed for space on my father's face. He looked around in complete bewilderment. I didn't know what to say or do. This was never included in my plans. I never imagined that anyone other than me would ever tell my father what was going on. Unexpectedly, however, a jealous, drunken idiot ruined everything. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, the bottom fell out. Three police officers pushed through the crowd and headed towards my father. 
He put his hands out to be cuffed, but they just looked at him. Sir, are you James Carson? Asked the first officer. My father nodded his head. Sir, we need you to come with us, please, the officer said. Do I have to wait until we get to the station to call my lawyer? Asked my father. The police looked at him like he was crazy. Sir, no one cares that you hit that drunk, the officer said. This is a private party. Security is responsible for maintaining order on the territory. If we're not called, we don't care. We came for you because your wife was in an accident. She fell? Asked my father. She was in a car accident, the officer said. She wasn't driving. The man with her also has very serious injuries. We'll follow you, Jim, Elena said. I was glad she took the lead because I was still in shock and felt so bad for my dad. Everything I planned, all my schemes were designed and intended to ensure that he experienced as little pain as possible. It all blew up in my face. Dean and Elena walked me out of the school. Everyone was staring at us. Elena threw me her keys and told me to follow her. She got into my father's car and followed the police. The tires squealed very loudly, but she soon pulled herself together. I followed her as she asked, and Dean followed me. I was most interested in how the hell my mom ended up in the accident. After all, she should have stayed at home. We went into the waiting room near the reception department. We were directed to a waiting room on the third floor, next to the operating rooms. This bothered me. And, as analytical as my mind is, it got me thinking. Here I sit, waiting for my mom to come out of surgery, and my only thoughts are about my dad and how this will affect my plans for him. Dean was very supportive as usual, but what surprised me most was Elena. I thought she would be a neutral observer, or at best a concerned friend. But she was clearly upset, and we didn't even know what had happened yet. I hugged her and told her everything would be fine. As we sat down, a woman came into the room with two small children. The woman greeted Elena and sat down on the other side of the room. Elena barely returned her greeting. She didn't take her eyes off the door. Sitting there, I considered all the possible variations of events and assessed how their possible outcomes might affect what I needed to do. The nightmare scenario for me was if somehow this accident would bring my parents closer together. I could imagine them having tearful conversations at her bedside and him agreeing to forgive her if she would just get better. She will then tell him that I knew about their relationship all along. It could ruin my relationship with the person I love the most. All this, despite my careful plans, turned into the worst nightmare imaginable. The door to the operating rooms and the corridor between them swung open. The doctor came out, followed by my father. Before I even realized the door had opened, Elena had already gotten up and walked towards her dad. She hugged him, and he put his arm around her waist as he continued to talk to the doctor. The thing that caught my eye the most was his face. My father tried to hold on, but he was clearly very angry. I moved closer to them to hear what they were saying. As I got closer, I heard parts of the conversation. I heard the doctor say, Uh... The head hit the center console under the airbag. I also heard, Uh... Will likely require reconstructive surgery if she survives. Another thing I only heard part of was, Can't figure out why her heed was there. Then I heard, the jaw closed and took a bite. This last remark completed the picture for me. I must be a monster because I turned around and ran out of the waiting room. I found the nearest toilet on the floor and made sure it was empty. Then I just burst out laughing. It took me about five minutes of hysterical laughter before I could put on a serious face. When I returned to the waiting room, I heard a slight argument. I'm telling you right now, if you do this your way, you will live your life with a lot of regrets. My father stood and Elena held his hand and told him to sit back down. But I don't care, he said. She's covered under my health plan. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to talk to her. I just want her out of my life. She pulled him back into the chair next to her and he didn't resist. Honey, I know you don't want to talk to her and that's why I want you to do it. If you really want her out of your life... Well, it just won't work, she said. He turned and looked at her, and she hugged him. If you leave this hospital and plan to never see or talk to her again, it still won't work. 
Maybe you can find a way to let the lawyers handle everything so you never have to talk to her. Either you get the house or she gets it and you never see each other again. He nodded his head. This won't work, Jim, she continued. I noticed that my father calmed down as she spoke. I also noticed that the woman on the other side of the room was listening to everything she said. This is the real world, and when two people have been together for a long time, they create bonds. The most important of these connections is that you have a beautiful daughter and she has many more events in her life where you will probably at least run into each other. Are you telling me that you won't go to Melinda's wedding because her mother will be there? Or do you want to tell me that you are such a cruel person that you would deny the woman who gave birth to her the privilege of seeing her only daughter marry? My father pursed his lip and crossed his arms over his chest. Elena took his hand again, locking it in hers. I'm not done holding this hand yet, she said. Regardless of how you feel about her, there is another problem, she began again. Even if you push her out of your life and avoid her, there is the concept of permission. Psychologists like to call this closure. I don't like this term because when it comes to people and emotions, nothing is ever really over. In five or ten years, even when you've resolved everything, there will still be fifty or sixty questions that you simply don't have answers to. But for your own sake, so that you don't spend the rest of your life doubting yourself, you need to talk to her. Damn, I thought. I was worried that Elena wouldn't be as persistent, and about my father, who was just as weak. Now things were moving so fast that I was gone for five minutes, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. Elena talked about the rest of their lives, as if it was a foregone conclusion that they would spend it together. And my father didn't argue with her. It was exactly what I wanted, but the sequence of events was not at all what I had planned. I probably shouldn't be upset because all I wanted was for my dad to separate from my cheating mom. I wanted him to find someone who would love him and who would be worthy of his love, and it looks like he will end up with the right woman. I just need to make sure all the parts are in place. After thinking about it, I stopped interfering. Let's let the universe sort it out. Life seems to have a way of working things out in the end. Now you're too nervous and too excited, Elena said. Stop drinking coffee, actually. I want you to just get out and go somewhere to calm down. Then come back to me and we'll wait for it together. You said she'd be in the OR for about another hour, right? She will have to stay in intensive care for at least that long. So you have time, but you can't just ignore it. I want you back in an hour. And what's about, he began. Melinda and I are here, she said. We can fill out any forms or do whatever needs to be done. I smiled at him as he looked at me. He came over and hugged me tightly. I walked over and sat down next to Elena. Go, Dad, I said. Elena is right. Driving always calms you down. As my father walked toward the door, a woman from across the room reached over and grabbed his sleeve. I'm so sorry for your pain, she said sadly. My father nodded his head. I don't even think he paid attention to what she said to him. Then I recognized her. It was Russell Eddington's wife. Elena started talking as soon as I sat down. Melinda, I thought you were the main schemer, she said. But your mother beat us all. She outplayed us all. She tricked your father into thinking she was sick, so she wasn't at the dance. She told you that if she was there, your father would be too shy to dance with me, right? I nodded, trying to understand what she was getting at. The call your father received when we arrived at the dance was from her, Elena said. I know that, I said. I was glad she called because she was the one who got daddy to dance with you. Don't, Helena said. She called him to make sure you and he were at the dance so she could sneak out. Hugs Russell. Apparently this time they were going to a motel, because last time you found them at your home. She didn't. She didn't know what time you were going to be home, and she didn't want to risk getting caught again. Apparently he lost control of the car or was simply not paying attention to the road, and they crashed into a tree. The airbags deployed perfectly, and Russell only had one injury, but it was a major one. Okay. It's probably a minor injury. I can't believe that damn bitch was going to cheat on him again, I said. Helena, Dad was right. We just don't need her in our lives. Maybe there's nothing they can do about it, a woman said from across the room. 
I don't understand you, ma'am, I said. But I don't understand your husband either. You are a beautiful woman, and you two have two adorable little girls. You are much more attractive than my mother. Why the hell would he cheat on you with her? Your mother is not the only one, she said, but she will probably be the last. Helena, he never cheated on you, did he? Of course not, Helena answered, as if she had been asked the most obvious thing in the world. But he tried, didn't he? Asked his wife. Helena nodded her heed. The only good thing about him is that he is a good provider. My girls and I need that kind of financial security. My plan was, wait until my girls are old enough to understand the situation and then divorce him. Now this could all be thrown into the air. I'm pretty sure your father is going to name Russell in his divorce case. I also, I'm sure when this happens your mom will sue him for something. And I'm sure he'll lose his job because of this. I may just have to go ahead and try to get my piece of the pie before it goes completely bust. I'm so sorry this has affected your family, young lady, she said. As she was saying this, a light bulb went on in my head. After some time, my father returned. Dean called his parents and told them he was going home. He hugged me and kissed me quickly and then said goodbye to everyone. My father sat down next to me where Dean was. I stood up and sat on his other side, pushing him next to Helena, who immediately took his hand back. We sat and talked about anything, but not about the accident. We talked for a long time. Eventually, I dozed off. When I woke up, the nurse tapped me on the shoulder. I fell asleep with my head on my father's shoulder. He was sleeping with his head thrown back, and Helena was in the same position as me, only on the other shoulder. She also hugged his arm, as if she had no intention of letting him go. I found it strange that I didn't remember my mother ever holding him so tightly. Can you wake up your mother and father and tell them that she is awake, but she can only have visitors for a few minutes and you better move quickly, because with the amount of painkillers they gave her, she will soon fall asleep. I woke up my father and Helena, thinking about what the nurse had called them. My mother and father. It really felt right. We took the elevator to the fifth floor. The nurse told us that we could come in one at a time and stay there for about five minutes. My father headed towards the door, and Helena grabbed his hand and pulled him back. Jim, don't go there angry. She just came out of surgery, so she's already in a lot of pain. Now is not the time to just stress over it. Just stop by and say hello. Can you do this for me? He clenched his fists, finally unclenched them, and nodded his head. Helena was amazing. My father entered the room. He was gone for about 15 seconds and immediately returned. I went in then. One side of her face was completely covered with a bandage. She had tubes that delivered medicine into one arm. Her shoulder was bandaged on the other side and they placed her in some kind of frame that kept her spine straight and prevented her from rolling over during the night. There was some kind of metal halo attached to her head, which went from top to bottom and prevented her from opening her mouth. I think she'll need this until her jaw heals. Her eyes moved with me as I walked around the room. Hi, Mommy, I said. How are you feeling? A sound came out of her mouth that was somewhere between a grunt and a squeal. I told you that if you cheat on him again, something bad will happen to you. But you didn't listen, so you deserve what you got. And what you get is a scam. Mom, since we're the only ones in the room, I'll let you in on a little secret. I was never going to lose sight of this. This was my plan from the very beginning. Ever since I first caught you, I've been looking for someone who can take care of Dad when I go to college. Helena is perfect for him. I appreciate you helping me put them together. Looks like she can handle it. Her eyes got bigger, and it seemed like she was trying to say something, but the metal circle was preventing her from moving. However, it seemed that even trying to move caused her pain. But you should be grateful to her. If it weren't for her, he wouldn't even come here to see you, I said. She looked at me angrily. Mom, don't be angry with me. It wasn't my fault. I'd like to think about it, though. Dad knows about you and Eddington, but I didn't tell him. He found out about it just before the police came for us. Guess what? It wasn't the police either. It was Coach Klitz. The coach was angry with Dad and Helena. He got drunk and told his dad he shouldn't. Dad knocked him out. He hit him on the ass in front of the whole school, including the kids on his team. It got me thinking. 
How exactly could the coach know that you were training Eddington? The coach and the director are not exactly friends. You were a coach too, weren't you, Mom? I looked into her eyes and she couldn't look me in the eyes. I just shook my head. What are you doing, Mom? Well, I guess my five minutes are up. I probably won't come to see you very often. So see you. When I went outside, Dad took my hand. Thank you for everything, Helena, he said. I don't think I could have done this without you. I've thought a lot about what you said and it makes sense, but I'm just not sure I can do it. I'm not sure I can pull this off. Even now, when she is not in the room, I want to strangle her. And that asshole Eddington... He took a deep breath to calm himself. Anyway, I'm sorry if my problems ruined your evening. Let's go, Keith. Let's go home, he said. Did you bring my car here? Helena did, I said. I drove her car. Remember, she handed you the keys. Do you still have my keys, Melinda? Helena asked. I nodded. Okay, see you at home. My father's mouth dropped, but he had been listening to her all evening, so he just agreed. When we got home, I just went over, changed my clothes, and went to bed. I could hear their conversation even when I fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I showered and went downstairs to grab something to eat. My father was sleeping and purring on the sofa. I heard movement in the kitchen. I walked in, and Helena was standing in front of the stove. She had two frying pans working. In one, she was frying bacon. In another, she was baking pancakes. What struck me most was what she was wearing. She was wearing my dad's U of M t-shirt and nothing else. I was sure she was wearing underwear, but I wouldn't bet on it. I borrowed a couple of things from you, she said. I didn't want to wake you. I can't fit any of your mom's things. This solved the underwear issue. Why didn't you borrow jeans or a skirt, I asked. She curled an eyebrow, and I understood. She wanted my father to see her in the things he loved most. We talked all night, she said. He's very upset. The two of us will have to help him get through this. Melinda, last night I told him everything about me. I think he's a little upset with me. Why should he be upset with you? I asked. Because I need to be honest with him, she said. I don't want any secrets between us. So I had to let him know that I was at the dance for a reason. I had to go ahead and tell him that I was pretty much stalking him. Ever since I first met him while hunting for specimens in the forest, I think it made him see me as something like your mother. I think he really believes that I will go after a married man. The only way to let him know that I'm actually not that bad would be to let him know who told me he was probably available, and I couldn't do it without giving you away. If I was not sure that it belonged to my father, then it was this statement that convinced me. She not only belonged to my father, she belonged to us. Don't worry, Helena, I said. We'll all be in order after breakfast. She nodded her head and picked up the fork she was using to flip the bacon and the spatula she was using to cook the pancakes. I took the fork. I'm terrible at making pancakes. After breakfast, Helena borrowed a pair of my sweatpants. Naturally, she chose blue ones, and they matched her dad's sweatshirt, which she refused to give up. She packed lunch, and while dad argues and complains all the way, she took us out of the house for a picnic. We found ourselves back in the forest, in the same place where we hunted for the specimen. The three of us talked the whole time, and I confessed everything. Helena also confessed to my father that she loved him. The saddest part was seeing that my dad was still angry, but just couldn't handle what my mom did. Several times, he told Helena how beautiful she was, and even said, I would be crazy about you if it weren't for... We all knew what he meant. Helena asked me why Dean wasn't here, and I reminded her that it was Sunday and that he would have to be at church until at least noon. As we left the park and headed home, we received a call from the hospital. Mom woke up and really wanted to see my father. He gave the nurse his grandmother's phone number and we went home. We stopped at Elena's apartment because she needed clothes. How long are you staying? Asked my father. She arched her eyebrow again, we watched movies and relaxed for the rest of the day. Dean joined us after leaving church. We sat there, watched movies, talked, laughed, and ate. I noticed that Helena was never more than a few inches away from my father. The next day, we all returned to the real world. I had to turn in assignments and take a test. 
People looked at me all day. The guys from the team constantly came up to me and shouted or laughed. Poo, they said. They also delivered mock strikes. I found out what was going on almost before lunch. Nobody knew what really happened at the dance. Not many people heard what Coach Klitz told my father, but everyone saw the results. The strange thing was that no one noticed it until this morning, but Coach Klitz was also in the hospital. When he landed on his butt, he broke his tailbone. The assistant coach conducted the training. Towards the end of the day, we were all called into the hall for a meeting. The deputy director explained to us that Principal Eddington had been involved in an accident over the weekend and would be hospitalized in the near future. She told us that we would continue to work as if he was still here because that's what he wanted. She told us to keep praying for him, and I was glad I didn't. One person asked how long he would be gone, and she told us that she didn't know, but that he would be back as soon as possible. Another person asked about the extent of his injuries. This made me laugh. I came home and looked in the refrigerator. I had already made dinner once or twice, so I decided I would make dinner. I had a lot of time because Dad wouldn't be home from work for at least another 90 minutes. I was very surprised when I heard a car drive up. I was even more surprised when I heard someone knock on the door. I opened it and saw Helena. I just stepped aside and she came in. She went into the kitchen and looked around. What are you doing? She asked. Burgers, I smiled. I'll cook them and let Dad fry them when he gets back from his run. He is running? She asked. I simply nodded. Okay, what are we cooking for the parties? She asked. I shrugged. How about a nice big salad? She asked. We'll mix everything we can find, and if you don't like it, just don't put it on the plate. That's a good idea, I said. She pulled out a large bowl and we chopped up the vegetables, onions, and mushrooms. Do you think he won't mind if I run away with him? She asked. I think he would like it, I said. And she did it. When my father returned home, she was waiting for him in her workout clothes, and I'm sure he noticed how great she looked. They came home, took a shower, and we all had dinner together. During dinner, we talked and avoided the gorilla in the room. Helena mentioned that her car made a strange sound and sometimes lost power. After dinner, Dad drove his car into the garage and got to work. Helena pulled out her reading glasses and began checking her papers in the garage next to him. My grandmother called and asked if she could come. Dad told her that she was always welcome. Once there, Helena went upstairs and took a long bath. My grandmother wanted to know why Dad wasn't in the hospital on Sunday or that day. She looked at me and asked if my father was stopping me from visiting my mother. Apparently, my mother didn't tell my mother anything. I know she had an accident, Jim, and she totaled the car. But it's not even your car. Why are you so angry with her? When Dad explained the situation and the details of the incident to my grandmother, she almost lost consciousness. She apologized to my father, and he explained that he made sure she received the best possible care, but he was still too angry and too hurt to go see her. After that, my grandmother left and still looked shocked as she got into her car and drove away. A week later, we all went to the Harvest Festival dance, me with Dean, of course, and Dad with Helena. If I thought she looked impressive at the practice dance, it was nothing compared to the real dance. The biggest difference was how they were treated. Everyone just knew they were a couple. Not a single guy came up to ask her to dance. I think there were two reasons for this. Firstly, because she didn't let my father go all night. She even held his hand while they ate. And secondly, people were still talking about what happened to the coach. I heard a few guys say, Dude, if you ask her to dance, this guy will knock you out. It was a wonderful evening. This allowed Helena to come out of her shell and really show people how friendly, charming, and funny she could be. She didn't have to worry about guys hitting on her all the time when my dad was around. Both her smile and the light in her eyes tripled. Of course, she smiled at him most of the time, but that's how it should be. Even after the dance became history, it simply changed. She no longer had to hide behind lab coats and stupid safety glasses, so a lot more guys crashed into the walls. But every night she waited for my father at home and sometimes even went to the factory where he worked, as if she couldn't wait for them to be together again. This continued for the next few weeks. Both Dad and Helena told me they would take me to the hospital if I wanted to go. 
Dad also told me that if I wanted to go alone, I would be more than happy to use Mom's car or the Jeep that Dad drove in the winter. As for Helena, they were almost never apart. They were only far from each other when they were at work and, of course, while they were sleeping. Their romance, if you can call it that, was strictly school level. I don't think I've ever seen them kiss. I knew how Helena felt about my father, but I wasn't sure how he felt about her until one evening he came home and she wasn't there. He didn't ask me anything, so I decided not to tell him. He looked around the house and then looked outside. He still didn't say anything, so I didn't provide any information. However, I secretly videotaped him looking around the entire house and repeatedly looking out the window. When she finally showed up, he pretended everything was fine. Oh, hi, he said, and headed into the garage. Helena looked at me strangely. What have I done? She asked. I told her. Why didn't you tell him we had a parent-teacher conference today? She asked. Because it's time, I said. Time for what? She asked. Elena, dad is stuck in limbo. It's time for him to return to the real world. He doesn't even think about his mother. She's been in the hospital for over a month now, and we haven't visited her once. I'll take you to her if you want, Elena said. Damn me, I said. I don't want to see her. Maybe he doesn't want to either, she said. Even as I watched the expression on her face when she said that, I knew her fur was standing on end and she was ready to fight for my father. Calm down, Elena, but we both know that he needs to start some kind of divorce proceedings or something like that. He can't just forget about her and hope she goes away. She texts me daily and I'm sure she texts him as well. As soon as she can talk, she will probably start calling. And then there are you two, I said. What's wrong with us? She asked. Her cheeks flushed and she blushed even as she said it. Elena, he really loves you very much, I said. You know it? Well, I more than just love him, she said. That's it. I said. But he's afraid to admit that he feels the same way about you. How do we know he really feels that way? She asked. Maybe he just considers me a family friend? I showed her the video I had just taken of him wandering around the house, looking into every room and constantly looking out the window. What was he looking for? She smiled. You, Elena? I smiled. He doesn't admit it, but he really missed you so it's time for him to stop pretending and move on with his life. Hold that thought, she said. Indeed, the time has come. I watched as she walked through the kitchen and out into the garage. My father was leaning over his car, doing something. I don't know what he does with this car all the time. I think he's talking to her, but she tapped him on the shoulder and he straightened up. She wrapped her arms around him and pulled his face to hers and kissed him. At first, he just stood there, but then his arms wrapped around her and he kissed her back. Watching them made me wish I wasn't such a good girl and that Dean and I didn't take the vow of chastity. This sight made my legs give way. Principal Eddington returned to school the next day, and the coach returned the next week. The coach walked bent over and very slowly. Eddington never left his office. He had a new secretary. It was his wife. She smiled at me every time I passed her in the hallways. She asked about her mother, and I had to say that I had not seen her. She asked me how my father was doing, and I think she cared. After all, she had been through what he had gone through, so she knew how much it hurt. I think they were all waiting to see what my father was going to do. Even Eddington himself asked me about my father. I had to tell him that it would be at least another week before Mom could remove the metal brace from her face and try to talk. I learned about this from my grandmother, who often called and asked us to visit my mother. It just seemed like everything was waiting for my father's decision and his plan of action. Eddington knew that if my father mentioned him in the divorce, his career would be over. My mom will probably try to sue him, whether successful or not, but the mere mention of what happened between them will further damage his career. Coach Klitz was afraid of me and stayed as far away from Helena as possible. He acted as if my father would come out from behind a tree and hit him again. He wrote to Helena a letter, apologizing to her for his behavior and promising to leave her alone. I think the biggest problem for him was that he was always considered the tough guy at school 
and many of his players still laughed at him behind his back. Helena and my father were also on standby. She practically lived with us, but they did not sleep together. They might as well have done it, because there were so many nights when I got up for a drink and found them sleeping together on the couch, still fully clothed, but huddled together as if their lives depended on it. Finally, the tension is over. Without hesitation, I picked up the phone and heard my mother's voice. Hey, Melinda, is your dad available? When my shock wore off, I handed him the phone. When he answered the call, his back straightened and his whole demeanor changed. He said a few words and hung up. Helena grabbed his hand and he smiled nervously. I don't think there's any point in putting it off any longer. Let the battle begin. The next day, he went to see her. From what he told me later, and from what I learned from my grandmother, when he entered the room, she was sitting upright in her bed. She lost some weight and put on makeup to reduce the effects of bruises. She continued to be aggressive as usual, but found that it no longer worked. James, I'm sad that you still haven't been able to come see me once, she said. How can we fix our marriage if we don't talk? I understand that I made a huge mistake and it will take us a long time to overcome this. In fact, I don't think we can handle this alone. I have a therapist in the hospital. She does family therapy. I think next time you come, maybe you should bring Melinda and we should have a session with her. My father didn't say a word. He simply placed a stack of papers on her bed next to her. She looked at the papers and cried. No, she said. We don't do that. We need to talk about this. Okay, let's talk to Teresa, he said. Talk to me about why you did this to us. Tell me about how our daughter found you and that idiot in our bed, in our house. Tell me about how an 18-year-old girl had to try to save her father because his heart was broken, and then he had to put all the pieces back together when I found out anyway. Tell me about how that idiot coach found out what you were doing to Eddington. Tell me about how Melinda caught you and you swore you would have stopped but started with him again. Come on, speak. Jim? I'm sorry, she whined. We have to get through this. I'll never do this again. I swear. You said the same thing to Melinda, he said. There's probably nothing more to talk about. Get yourself a lawyer, Teresa. The next day, my mother was served with official divorce papers in her hospital room. According to the grandmother who was there, a girl who looked like a student entered the room, chewing gum and carrying a folder. Teresa Carson? she asked. My mother expected this and simply extended her hand. This started the battle. Over the next few weeks, they fought. They exchanged accusations. My mother refused to agree to the divorce and even made counter accusations. She claimed that dad moved his mistress into the house, which was technically true. Elena felt terrible about this. The day after the allegations surfaced, she returned to her apartment for the first time in months. My father went and brought her back home. He told her that her place was with us and nowhere else. The fight continued for weeks. I finally couldn't stand it. I asked Dad when his next meeting with Mom and her lawyers was. He told me the next day. I went and saw my mother that evening. I explained to her that she had lost her dad. There was simply no chance that he would ever take her back. The best she could do was at least remain polite Things went so far back and forth that the Pope withdrew his original proposal for an agreement. Now he didn't offer her anything. He just wanted to say, fuck you, get out of my house. Dad wanted a house, full custody of me, and not to have Mom bother him anymore. He refused to pay her for ruining his life. He also planned to sue Eddington for everything he could. I invited Mr. Eddington and his wife to a meeting. I sat at a long table with Dad and Elena at one end. Mom and her lawyers were on the other side, and Mr. Eddington and his wife were on one side. I presented them with my plan. My plan called for Mr. Eddington to pay my mother child support for four years and rehire her as his secretary. That way, Mom could go back to college and learn some skills so that when child support runs out, she can support herself. Dad got the house, Mom kept her car, and she rented Elena's apartment. In exchange, Dad agreed not to sue or mention Mr. Eddington in the divorce suit, and Mom didn't try to make her fake sexual assault case. I could agree with that, Eddington said. His wife looked relieved. 
She smiled at me and told me that I would be a great lawyer someday. It was a good deal for the Eddingtons. Paying my mom child support for four years would be expensive, but not as expensive as any of the lawsuits my parents could file. He was also able to keep his job. Neither my father nor my mother looked convinced. It just doesn't feel right, my father said. It turns out that they destroyed my life and my family for free. Teresa simply leaves without facing any problems and without punishment. And he just goes away and saves his career. I won't agree to this at all, my mother said. I'm not going to give up on my family. I admit that I was wrong, but I was forced. Eddington was the boss. He was a man with power. I had no choice. If I hadn't made a deal with him, I might have lost my job. It's too late for me to start over. I want my life and my family back. Shut up, Mom, I said sharply. You need to accept this agreement so we can all move on. Mr. Eddington may have been your boss, but you forget that I caught you. And if I testify about what I heard and saw, your case will fail. You also forget that at the time of the accident, you were no longer working for Mr. Eddington, so there could have been no coercion. There are two more things you need to consider. First, just one word from me is all it takes for Dad to drop you from his health insurance. Without this, you will never find the money to fix your face. You'll have to spend the rest of your life looking like a Picasso painting. And finally, Mom, you didn't just give up your family, you threw it away. We just weren't as important to you as what you did with Mr. Eddington, so you don't deserve us. If you go too far, there may not even be an opportunity to become friends in the future. Make the right choice, Mom. Stop some of Dad's pain. Let him go. I turned to my father. Dad, you're right. Of course he. You are the one who suffered here. I see it. So, I'll just tell you two things because while you were right in your argument, you need to look beyond that. Both Mama and Mr. Eddington really pay for what they did. Maybe it's not enough, but they pay. Mr. Eddington has lost an important part of his anatomy. Apparently, it won't be easy for him. The reimplantation surgery was unsuccessful, and they are going to try to create a new one for him. So that's one of the ways he pays. He'll also pay mom child support, so you don't have to. Isn't that enough to make him suffer? Or should his family pay too? His children deserve care too, Dad. They are victims too. If you ruin his career, you will also ruin the lives of two innocent children who did not harm you. It won't be easy for him anyway, even if you do this. His wife hates him. She will make his life hell, and he will have to work with his mother every day while she blames him for losing us. It won't be easy either. Mom suffers too, Dad. She loses the man she claims to love and her daughter too. She loses her home and most of her friends. Even the job Mr. Eddington offers her is temporary. She will have to gather her strength and start her life over. Life is not so easy for older single women. My mom started crying. And if you look at it, Dad, it will be better for you in two ways. You're getting rid of a woman you could never trust again. You get rid of a woman who cheated on you more than once. You can move on with your life and never see her again. We both can. And in return, you get the sweetest, most beautiful, most wonderful woman I know to share your life with. My father smiled and hugged Elena. Why are you hugging her? I was talking about myself, I quipped. Very funny, Keith, said Elena. My father nodded his head. Okay, I agree, he said. I looked at my mother. She nodded her head, then lowered it and began to cry again. The lawyers agreed to formalize everything as I said. The idea of forcing one of the cheaters to pay alimony to the other was unusual, but both parties were confident that they could arrange it. If the judge doesn't agree with it as written, Mr. Eddington will simply send child support to Dad, who will then give it to Mom. Three days later, they met again to sign documents. My mother brought my grandmother with her. My father was with Elena and me, and Mr. Eddington was alone. After signing the documents, my mother reached out to my father with tears in her eyes. She asked him for one last kiss, and Elena said, No. Probably a week later, Elena came to me for help. She gave me money and the keys to her car and asked me to take Becky and Dean to the movies. I'm probably not the wittiest person because I didn't understand at first. 
Then she suddenly realized that she wanted to spend time alone with my father. I laughed and looked at her. You don't have to send me away, I said. Is this something special? Have you already started experimenting? What do you usually do? We haven't actually... Oh my God, I said. I'm leaving. I didn't know you two weren't yet. It must have gone very well because the next morning they were both grinning from ear to ear. A few months later, and here we are at church. I stand here, fulfilling the role of both bridesmaid and bridesmaid. Hell, why not, since I was the one who introduced them and brought them closer together. The problem is that my mom just won't shut up. I'm not sure why they invited her. Maybe they wanted to rub her nose in the face. Maybe she just barged into the wedding. But we had to have this wedding this week. I'm leaving for college next week, and I'm not sure how long Elena will be able to fit into her wedding dress. The doctor says she may be pregnant with twins. A few minutes later, the priest asked a question at the end of the wedding vows. Does anyone here know of any reason why this man and woman should not be engaged? I approached my mother. When she was about to speak, I leaned over and whispered in her ear, Mom, if you open your mouth, I will slap you here in this church. Well, this is the part where I have to say, and they lived happily ever after. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.